Is some knee hyperextension a problem on the calf press machine? If it's causing you pain or discomfort, then it is likely a problem. If it is not causing you any pain or discomfort, it probably is not a problem. What program would you recommend for a complete beginner for bodybuilding or strength, respectively? Just pick any linear progression program that fits your goals. So if you're interested in hypertrophy, pick a bodybuilding linear progression. And if you're interested in strength, do any of the 5x5 or 3x5 programs. How would you recommend doing a quick peak for just one lift? So peaking is, always works the same way. You're going to do high intensity to maintain as many adaptations as possible while bringing your fatigue as close to zero as possible. So basically, depending on how advanced you are, you can go in and do like one all out set, take a couple extra rest days, get your fatigue as close to zero as possible, and then max out. But that, the basic formula is the same. Maintain adaptations with high intensity, low volume, and then take time, time off to max. What would you add to strong lifts five by five? I wouldn't add anything to it, man. Like don't try to take a strength training program and turn it into a bodybuilding linear progression. If you're interested in hypertrophy training and not strength training, go find a hypertrophy based linear progression that's actually aimed at people who want to get bigger and run that instead. And yes, I should probably have calf raises and curls and maybe laterals as well. So it's pretty obvious that I'm just going to keep getting ass novice linear progression stuff until I create a program myself. So in the meantime, I will give you guys a free program that you can do with A, B rotations. Workout A is going to be a chest press, a pull down, a tricep extension, a calf raise, and a squat. Pick your favorite variation. You could do barbells or machines. Doesn't really matter. Workout B, we're going to do a shoulder press, a row, a curl, a lateral raise, and a hinge, which is some type of deadlift. Please don't pick in mornings. Pick a deadlift variation. There you go. I'm not going to give you sets or rep ranges or any of that. You can at least figure that out on your own. After leg day, I have delayed onset muscle soreness in my quads that comes on after everything else, like glutes and hamstrings. Why? Um, honestly, I have no idea. I don't know the physiology well enough to give you the explanation as to why delayed onset muscle soreness can occur well after the session and longer time periods on some muscles than others. What I will tell you is that it, it probably really doesn't matter, honestly. As I've said over and over again, I actually almost never, ever get sore. I don't think getting sore is a good thing, personally. How much will doing arm isolations affect subsequent compounds if you do them first? So this can have almost no impact or it can have a ton of impact, particularly in the case of triceps. If you do your triceps before you do shoulder pressing and chest pressing, it can potentially turn them into triceps limited exercises. And so that would go from primarily shoulder and chest volume to primarily tricep volume. So you got to be careful with this. Do you know why bodybuilders sometimes focus on plank work during prep? So if we're going to be honest, a lot of times if you ask a, a bodybuilder why they're doing something, they won't know. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't doing something useful. It just means that they're not going to be able to give you some mechanistic explanation that makes any sense. What I would say is that doing plank work can give you some conditioning for controlling your waist, which uh, helps you to hold poses longer without getting tired and letting your stomach out. Is there any benefit to doing short bias exercises over mid and lengthened bias exercises? Well, on a set per set basis, exercises with a short bias strength curve are going to be easier to recover from, and the strength curve of an exercise can affect which muscle fibers are maximally recruited, so it can affect which muscle fibers receive the biggest stimulus. If I have a fixed weekly schedule and I'm training the same movement more than once per week with different amounts of rest, should I train the movement in the same rep range and progress it separately or use different rep ranges? Personally, I just wouldn't do that at all. I would just use a different movement because from a hypertrophy perspective, if you're not going in and setting a PR when you're training a movement, you are not providing an optimal stimulus for muscle growth. So if this is a strength training thing, sure, fine. But for hypertrophy, just pick a secondary movement. What's the best way to progress if I'm only going to be pulling heavy once every 10 to 14 days? I mean, that just doesn't change anything, right? Your frequency has nothing to do with your progression model. So personally, I use simultaneous double progression, which is where I add a micro load in terms of weight. And I try to at least match reps, but preferably I add reps. And if you're only doing it every 10 to 14 days, that would be a great model for you because it'll auto-regulate your rate of progression. What is the optimal amount of warm up? I mean, this is totally person dependent. It's even condition dependent, right? The amount of warm up you'll need in the dead of winter with no heat is going to be very different than if you're training at 90 degrees and you're outside. But personally, the heuristics that I use for warm up are really simple. I want to feel physically and psychologically ready for my top set. And then I also want to perform well on the top set. I shouldn't be having a situation where my second set is way better than my top set. I don't do any mobility or any cardio. I start with the bar. 
it's possible to have different volume needs for different divisions of a muscle. So yes, but this is also like super nerd shit that you really shouldn't care about. For example, a lot of people will report that they need more side delt volume than front delt volume, especially direct front delt volume work. But that's also because you do tons of front delts in any kind of pressing. Another thing is that it's really impossible to isolate one division of a muscle. Like if you're doing incline, you are training lower, middle, and upper pec still. So I don't think about this, like at all. Does using a safety bar make a squat pattern more quad biased? No, it doesn't. I mean, what, what can happen is that if the bar sits higher on your back, this can make it easier for you to stay upright and keep your hips underneath you. But what makes the squat pattern quad biased is having your knees shoved far forward over your toes and having your hips stay underneath you. No matter what bar you use, if your hips shoot back and your knees pull back, you're going to start biasing the hips. And again, the bar is secondary to that. Is it typical to necessitate much more volume for pull than push? No, I don't think so. It's just that when push exercises are more spread out, but if you added up all your compounds and all your isolations for chest, shoulders, triceps, and side delts, and then compare that to all of your back work, I bet you it's not as different as you think. It's just that with back work, it's more concentrated because there's really only two variations to split it up into, which are rows and pull downs, most of which are short biased. What do you think about calorie maintenance over the long term for a casual trainee? I'm just trying to stay in shape and maybe grow some muscle in the long term, five plus years. The real question is, man, why are you asking me for permission on what you clearly want to do? You don't need my or anyone else's permission to do what you want to do. If it's not worth it to you to go through cut and bulk cycles because you really don't care if you gain a ton of muscle anymore and you just want to quote unquote stay in shape, then yeah, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. You don't need anybody's permission. This is just fine. Do I think you're going to gain a lot of muscle? No. And the reason for that has less to do with the calorie maintenance thing and more to do once you shift to the attitude of like, I'm done building, your effort is so slowly going to slip more and more and more over the years and you probably will backslide just a little bit, if anything. What would be the ratio of a raw deadlift compared to a deadlift with belts and straps? There is no such thing. Some people, there will literally be, literally be zero pounds difference because there are some people that get nothing from a belt and actually pull beltless in competition. There are some people that get absolutely nothing from straps. These are conventional pullers with really strong grip, sometimes hook grip pullers get absolutely nothing from straps. And then there are other people that can't hang on to anything over 600 pounds, but can do 900 pounds with straps. Some people get 20% from a belt. So it's just going to be on a case by case basis, but potentially there's a huge difference or no difference at all, depending on the person. How would you assess one lift that is stalled when everything else is progressing? I would, if it was actively regressing, meaning I was losing reps and having worse performances, I would add recovery by either decreasing volume by one set or decreasing frequency. If it wasn't practical to decrease frequency because I didn't want to change my whole split for one movement, then I would rotate it out. If I was stagnating in approximately the same spot and getting this about the same amount of reps with the same amount of weight, I would add a set to see if I could get it unstuck. How was surgery? Are things progressing smoothly in recovery? Surgery was great. I had an excellent surgeon, barely any pain. I didn't need um, opioids or anything after the surgery. Got back into the gym two days after surgery. And so far I am ahead of the rehab schedule by about a week and a half. And it's been three weeks, if that gives you any indication. It is accepted that different bench angles cause regional hypertrophy. No, that's not quite correct, actually. Different bench angles will lead to different arm paths of the humerus specifically, which will bias different divisions of the pec. That is not the same thing as regional hypertrophy. Regional hypertrophy refers to like proximal or distal to the, to the joint that the muscle crosses. So you can, you know, hypertrophy your quad down by the knee or up by the hip. That's regional hypertrophy. Um, as far as how to bias the lats or the teres, very similar to the pecs, actually, it's going to come down to arm path. Keeping in mind that all pull downs train the lats and the teres, it seems to be that an elbow path that is very tucked close to the sides will bias the lats a little bit more, and elbow paths that are a little bit out wider will bring in a little bit more teres, but again, all train both. Objectively speaking, are hammer curls for biceps hypertrophy or forearm hypertrophy? Uh, the answer is kind of both. The hammer curls are going to bias one of the three major elbow flexors called the brachialis, and that actually runs along the upper arm and the forearm, and it sits beneath the bicep. So it will contribute to upper arm size as well as forearm size. The biceps brachii also flexes the elbow, but its primary function is as a supinator, and it's only in the upper arm, and that's what we're training with most curl variations or trying to. A reverse curl is going to train primarily the forearms, but 
All three of the major elbow flexors, the brachialis, the brachioradialis, and the biceps brachii work in all curling variations. Grip just changes the bias.